वसुदेवसुतम देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु so we were doing the third chapter of the bhagavad gita and we were on the 21st verse let's just chant 20 20th and 21st again karmanaiva hi sansiddhim karmanaiva hi sansiddhim आस्थिता जनकादय आस्थिता जनकादय लोकसंग्रह लोकसंग्रह संपश्यन कर्मसी संपश्यन कर्मसी यदाचरतीश्रेष्ठ यदाचरतीश्रेष्ठ तदेतरो जन तदेतरो जन स यमाण कुरुते स यमाण कुरुते लोकस्तुवर्तते तदनुवर्तते विवर एट दिस पॉइंट राइट ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट ऑल राइट सो वॉट इज बींग डिस्कस्ड हियर इज श्री कृष्ण से इज about the question of action how do we relate it to our lives when we are spiritual seekers quite apart from all our spiritual practices you may be meditating you may be devotional you may be studying philosophy all of that is very good and that's core of spiritual practice doing good uh, good work serving others but then life is also there uh, to be led you have jobs and families your personal life what do we do with that how do we spiritualize it uh, to what extent do you engage with the world so the in recent years in buddhism there has been this big movement called engaged buddhism engaged buddhism means uh, what is buddhism's take on the important social uh, issues of the day what's buddhism's take on um, Uh, on global warming on, on on a multitude of social and economic issues in the world today uh, how do we change and reform and develop society um, do good to people using buddhism and that has been a big movement i was waiting for the push back and today i read this uh, uh, article it says it's an it's an article on the name of the article says it all disengaged buddhism So it's a proposal. <laughs> it's it's. Like I've not read the article yet. I don't know what what the. It's a professor of philosophy. Uh, and I just want to make a comment here. It's something that I've been seeing at the Harvard Divinity School also, but not just at the Harvard Divinity School. It's also across this country and across the world. Religions in recent years faced with dwindling interest uh, from from people. have uh, discovered uh, as kind of great urge to look for ways to make themselves relevant so uh, religions what we are doing for the homeless all good good all very good causes for um, preventing global warming for the lgbtq till it seems um especially in a, in an academic setting when i see w- the discussions going on in the classrooms and outside at the divinity school for example that that's what religions are they are huge social and moral reformers and progressives in society nothing could be further from the truth i think my personally think this is you have to understand this properly and i, I would love your reactions i personally think that the leaders of religion are making a great mistake the great mistake is this in trying to stand up for good things in society which religion should what they are forgetting is 
the core, the, what you call the unique selling point of religion, let's put, uh, use a marketing term, right? the uniqueness of religion. Why do we come to religion? Because religion gives us the best politics? No, it doesn't. Religion gives us the best environmental ethics? Not really. You could make a case for it, but that was never ever the central thesis of religion. Religion is at its heart transcendental, and if it's not that, it's nothing. Religion at its heart says that there is this ultimate reality which transcends our empirical, quotidian life. And if you find it, if you tune yourself to it, you are blessed, your problems are solved, and this life also becomes blessed. Not emphasizing that, and then looking up social issues which you can cherry pick every 20 years the issue changes and you pick up one and say we stand for this <laughs> or even more stupid we stand against this right. that uh, that is a losing proposition why i will tell you so religion um, is it progressive on women's rights or not and that's a big issue of discussion it's an issue which should be discussed and we should um, be open to change and pro uh, progress and definitely. So these are things to be taken care of. But at its heart, religion is not there as a champion of women's rights or somebody else's rights. What happens when you do that is one becomes inauthentic. It just takes uh, anybody with a little bit of common sense to point out for centuries and millennia religions have been massively patriarchal. You suddenly um, try to push yourself forward as the face of change and progress, it doesn't cut any ice. What is the source of um, equality for women or gender rights or whatever it is? Modern constitutions, the law of the land, the ideas of con the constitution here, democracy, human rights. Uh, religion may have contributed something to it over centuries because religion has contributed a lot to human civilization more than anything else. So if I come forward and say, look, here is my religion. It's better than all others because it gets, gives more rights to women. The immediate reaction should be our constitution in this country or any, any modern democracy gives much more rights than your religion <laughs> to, to women today. Uh, by doing that, do you follow what I'm, what I'm saying? By doing that, you are undercutting the central purpose of religion. And then what happens is, then you sit back and wonder, at the divinity school, for example, people are wondering, why are people losing interest in the number of nuns, N-O-N-E, -N -E, nuns. Nearly a quarter of American adults say they are not interested in organized religion. They don't identify as any religion at all. Quarter, nearly a quarter. That's a huge, huge number. And that's the fastest growing segment. Right. Not Christians, Buddhists, or uh, Muslims, or Hindus, no. The fastest growing segment is people who don't want to uh, identify with religion. So, I hope you don't misunderstand me. My position is religion should be progressive, religion should be liberal. Everything that, that runs counter to modern progressive values, which religions should take a hard look at what they have been saying and be open to change. At least be at par with civilization, not behind, net, not 10 steps behind civilization. You don't have to be 10 steps ahead either. Uh, Ken Wilbert put it this way. Um, he said in the 21st century, to remain relevant, religions have to do three things. One, to stop fighting among each other. That really turns off people today. Right. <laughs> Carry on ancient enmities. Right. Um, so religion is a cause of quarreling and violence uh, and between people and nations. That has to stop, number one. Number two, Religion has to be in sync with science, with reason. Like it or not, we are in the age of science. Just because my book says some particular doctrine, and I take it literally, and it flies against every, against proven science, right? common sense, against science, against which is mainstream. You have to be willing to let go. Swami Vivekananda said, that religion should subject itself to the same tests that science does. And if something does not satisfy those tests, something is proven to be false, he says, let it go, no matter how su uh, sweet and comforting. That which is false is can, in the long run, never be good for us. 
So si science and religion must be harmonized with science. I am not saying that you have to adopt a scientific, reductionist, materialist worldview. Not at all. A materialist, it's a worldview. It's not science. But the proven facts of science, uh, which are established beyond doubt, one should not go against those things. Be rational, yes. Reason. Um, and religion will not suffer for it. Absolutely not. There is not a single doctrine, at least in Vedanta there isn't. There is not a single tenet um, in the higher spirituality which is found in every religion which is against science. Nowhere. I, I, I have no problems with it. I have friends who are leading scientists. I have a friend who is a monk and a leading mathematician. Um, cutting edge, doing cutting edge work in string theory. No problem being a monk. Third, Ken Wilber says, religion must not be against the progressive values of civilization in the 21st century. Whether it is on gender or race or environment or whatever, religion should not uh, be, be seen as obsolete and pulling backwards there. Yeah. At least be in harmony with, with progressive thinking in, in uh, uh, human civilization. Up to that, it's fine. And, and it, that should be. So that's my position. That's what I'm saying. What about action? What about our day-to-day -day life? Should we act? You might say, Swami, are you making a case for religion withdrawing from public life and being disengaged, disengaged Buddhism? So that's a big temptation. Uh, when you are, on one hand, is becoming embroiled in uh, social justice issues and that becomes all of religion and then people lose interest in it. On the other hand, is a kind of withdrawal from society, a kind of solipsistic withdrawal into oneself where one has no connection with the issues of the day and with society. So that's the issue which uh, Krishna is dealing with here. He is saying that be engaged, act before you great kings, but Arjuna is a, is a king, a prince. So great kings, princes before you like Janaka, he says Janaka and others, they reached perfection through action. Now at this point, Arjuna might think, well, Janaka reached perfection in what sense? Maybe he did karma yoga to purify the mind, the whole Shankara uh, structure of uh, sadhana, of spiritual practice. He did karma yoga to purify himself and then reached perfection through knowledge. And then he had no need of action any further. But that's not true because Janaka remained an emperor throughout his life. Or the second option could be, he was already enlightened, and yet he kept on acting, I and mean, kept on working in, in society. For what? Krishna says, loka sangraham, for the welfare of the world, for doing good to the world. I have drawn a fine distinction. I hope it's not too fine. <laughs> it's like splitting uh, hair, a hair splitting distinction. Yes, one must be engaged and do good to the world. No, that is not the purpose of religion. This is what I'm trying to say. The central purpose of religion is God realization, enlightenment, nirvana, moksha, whatever you say. That is the purpose. And that, having attained that, Krishna recommends, on your way to attaining that, or having attained it, be engaged in action. Work for the welfare of the world. So this is what he has said. Why should I do that if Arjuna feels? Maybe Janaka did it, but suppose I don't do it. What's the harm if I do not do it? Then Krishna replies, there is a harm. Yadyadacharati shreshta. Whoever, whatever the leading persons in society do, in any organization, in the family, in the community, in the organization, in nations and in civilizations, those whom we look up to, what they do, the rest of us tend to follow. I, I told you that child psychologists say that children do not listen, they'll imitate. Well, we are all children at some level or the other. So we love to imitate follow whom we like or admire. So those whom we like or admire, suppose as an enlightened person, does that person need to do anything at all, anymore, for attaining the goal of life, which already this person has attained? No. So can that person see his action? Will there be any harm? Maybe no harm to that person as such, but there could be a harm to everybody else. Uh, those who look up to that person, and they may think that, oh, so maybe I don't need to meditate anymore. Look, here is Krishna. 
who is the perfect yes. embodiment of all these spiritual values. And he doesn't seem to be meditating. He's having a good time, uh, uh, you know, with the driving the cows around in Vrindavan or uh, dancing with the gopis or fighting a war in <laughs> politics and whatnot. So maybe I don't need to meditate also. Bad example. <laughs> because there is actually a book, Hari Vamsha, which talks about the life of Krishna. And there you see what an extraordinary routine he followed, getting up before sunrise and meditating for hours on end before he um, uh, t takes care of other duties in life. So, Whatever uh, a person of excellence does, others follow. So you, Arjuna, are a leader in society. If you do not act, if you, you do not fulfill your duties, you do not do what is good for yourself and society, others are going to do the same thing. Others are going to do the same thing. One more bad example. The Buddha. And it's sacrilegious to say <laughs> anything like that, but there is a point to it. The huge amount of monasticism which followed the Buddha. Because he became a monk and he insisted on monasticism. So over the centuries, monasticism became very popular in India. Thousands of Buddhist monks, uh, huge monasteries, and all supported on public funds and by the, by the laity. In the long run, it didn't do much good, either to the monks themselves or to society. So, uh, if you have uh, an example, yes, there is some. There are some people who need to become monks, who do become monks. But there are a large number of people who remain in society and are very spiritual too. And the uh, ideal should show that. That even while being a king, like he says, while being a king. Or so in our mythology you find uh, examples of housewives who were enlightened, a butcher who was enlightened, uh, um, a king, a minister, a warrior, um, a hunter in the jungle. So many examples of people are in, in, in on the margins of society or in the mainstream. And many of them, uh, or all of these were examples of people who were enlightened. Showing, quite apart from the fact of enlightenment, showing that it is possible at any station of life, if you want it. It's not that it will come automatically, of course, if you want it. He makes a point here, which I did not uh, attend to last time. Sayat pramanam kurute lokastha danuvartate. This person of excellence whatever the literal meaning is, whatever he shows to be the pramana, the, the um, pramana literally means instrument of knowledge or uh, that by which we get knowledge. But here, what he means is this. And this interpretation I'm taking from Madhusudan Saraswati. He says, suppose I raise a question like this. Arjuna, suppose Arjuna has a question in the mind like this. Um, you gave the examples of Janaka and others. But why should I look at Janaka and others? I will do what the scripture tells me to do. For this we need to know, in Vedanta, the pramana, the source of knowledge, is the shruti or the text. The Upanishad is the source of knowledge. So Upanishads, the Gita is based on the Upanishads. So I will look at the scriptures, let's say in a wider canvas, I will look at the scriptures of my tradition, what they tell me to do, I will do. Why should I see what this person did or that person did? I will do what, what the text tells me to do. Now that has been the opinion of many people. The problem with that, only problem with that is, when I try to do what the text tells me to do, it's still my interpretation. You cannot get around that. We can't say, no, it's your interpretation, but what I'm doing is that what the text tells me to do. <laughs> yes, the text has told you to do it, and you have filtered it through your understanding and mind. Means we, especially in this country, you know, uh, in the and increasingly in India too, it's a very individualistic age, so we will say, yes, it's my understanding. What's wrong with that? <laughs> we are all, and we are encouraged. Come to your own understanding, um, which is absolutely necessary. But uh, let me give you a like that engaged Buddhism and disengaged Buddhism, let me give you an argument against your own understanding. One sadhu in Uttarakhand said this. He said, I will do so because I have understood it. Let others say what they will. This is the heights of foolishness and the heights of ignorance also. Why? I have become attached to and identified with one intellect. 
how do I know that this intellect is the best of all? It's an instrument. You see, why we, we behave in this way? Because we are so attached to the intellect, so, so identified with the mind. I see no difference between myself and the mind. When I say, I have understood it this way, so I will do it. No. One of the instruments at your disposal, the intellect, has understood this text in this way. Be dispassionate about it. Okay, m my understanding is this. Let me look at the understandings of a few other people. How is this intellect far superior to every other intellect throughout civilization? <laughs> Crazy. When you put it that way, it looks very stupid. Okay. Yes. That's inevitable. One can't uh, bypass that. But then that only gives me more reason to make sure that I get as good an understanding as possible. And uh, there Krishna says, look at the examples. That's why I always say, when we have deep philosophical questions or questions about what to do in life, look at those you consider to be exemplary. Look at the lives of the saints of the Jivan Muktas, the enlightened people, what would they have done? So often they ask, what would Jesus do? <laughs> it's a good question. What would Swami Vivekananda do in this way, in this situation? Or what would um, uh, Krishna do? Or, or s at least tell me to do? So the highest ideal, uh, I'll come to you. We must take that into account. Will it, isn't the example of the saints contradictory? Could be. But generally, it's a very, very good example, very high example. How they understand the text and they exemplify it in their lives is a very good input to have. Again, one must not be fanatic about it. Know the text very well and see how the saints have lived their lives. Uh, how people, uh, how, how great people, pre people you admire, um, what did they do in such circumstances? That's a good way of, good way of understanding it. Ultimately, again, you, of course, yes. True, true, true. You thought of it, but many people might not. One person might say, this is what the Gita tells me to do, and this I will do. And uh, I can do something very narrow and uh, limiting. It could happen. But Shruti tells it. The Shruti always, Upanishads always point you. It gives, see, which is higher, text or the enlightened person? It, it's a, the enlightened person, but in Hinduism. And there is a danger to that. What is the danger? I can claim to be enlightened. <laughs> and then every fool gathers a few foolish followers. <laughs> and then in the eyes of my foolish followers, I am the enlightened person. So what I say becomes pramanam, the authoritative commandment. And because it's there in their minds that the enlightened person is higher than the text, uh, then uh, let's follow this guy. Forget about text. No. Uh, a balance is required. Always exercise your reason. Um, Shruti, Yukti, Anubhuti is the formula. Shruti is the text. Yukti is reason. It must not fly in the face of reason. It must not be irrational. And Anubhuti, the experience of enlightened beings. Not the experience, somebody claims an experience and then asks you to go against the texts and go against your reason. Be careful. Be careful. Did that? Uh, yeah. Well, but you are, you are just uh, giving an input. That's true. The Shruti always, in, in Hinduism, we always, uh, the person who was enlightened, Yatra Veda Veda Bhavanti. There comes a point where even the Vedas are no Vedas. For you, you have reached such a point. But Arjuna might ask, I, I, suppose I have reached such a point, then why should I do anything for anybody else? And he says, 
that is not the way of the enlightened ones. They always work for the welfare of others. So you should also be engaged in the in work for the welfare of others. They did what? They should go and see. They come in like two hours of walking and they see the servants walking. Absolutely. Almost always. That's why I'm very careful. Yeah. There are exceptions. There are no rules for the enlightened person. That's, th that's the uh, good thing and the dangerous thing also. So that's why one has to be, uh, in general, yes. The standard is set by the scriptures. But then which scripture and what is the interpretation? That's the thing. So it's always good to look at the lives of enlightened people and, and the texts and one's reasoning. The thing is, uh, there is no one size fits prescription for everybody. That is one thing that Hinduism came to, a, thank God, an understanding thousands of years ago. A vast range of prescriptions are there. Is action necessary? Absolutely. And absolutely not. <laughs> is meditation good for you? Yes and no. Devotion meant for you? Absolutely. And no. What do you mean? It depends. Everything really depends. Where does the shoe pinch? Where am I starting off? Swami Ashokanandaji's famous admonition to, uh, not famous, uh, nice admonition to one of his disciples. He was in the Vedanta Society of Northern California and he insisted, he was a great Vedantin, talking about non-dual philosophy, but he insisted on karma yoga. Everybody should work hard and uh, dedicate the, uh, and be detached and dedicate the fruits of action to the Lord. So he is scolding one of the devotees. He, I think it was a letter probably. Madam, you think that I am telling you to do karma yoga action because I, I don't think you are ready for meditation. And you think I will show the Swami. <laughs> and you will. Only not in the way you thought you would. <laughs> if once one pursues this path sincerely, one very quickly, if one is honest to oneself, you don't have to tell anybody else. One is honest to oneself, one very quickly sees where one is and what one needs right now. The problem with the scripture directly is interpretation of the scripture, going to the scripture and scripture only. This has happened again and again in history with mixed results. I remember in class, our professor was visiting Vienna and he came back, not Vienna, Geneva. And he came back, that was the source of the, um, one of the main strands of the Protestant movement. So he came back and he was talking about the, um, you know, when Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church, the cry was sola scriptura, the scripture alone. Why should I listen to the Pope or the Catholic Church? The scripture alone. Let me go directly to the Bible and I will do what the Bible tells me. Why should I follow the church? Why should I follow Pope? Why should I follow the saints? So that discussion was going on. And I said, and what was the result? The result was a hundred different denominations, a hundred little churches with their own doctrines. Did you get one interpretation of the Bible, the true, one true interpretation of the Bible? Yes, you did. But the one true interpretation of the Bible was actually a hundred or more, or two hundred. There are thousands of, now what you have is thousands of churches and denominations, each claiming to have, or most of them at least, those are more n narrow ones claiming to have the interpretation of the Bible. Not true. It's still an interpretation. Always good to look at the lives of um, people who have sincerely followed this path. Yeah. And ultimately, it's your own decision, of course. So Madhusudan Saraswati makes that point. If Arjuna asks, why should I not look at the text alone? And why should I look at Janaka and all these examples you have cited? Krishna says, it is people like this who make it a pramana. So yat pramanam kurute. What does the text say? Everyone will give a different interpretation. What should I do? Look at what this person you consider to be a saint did with that scripture. That's a very good. Uh, that's a very good light on the scripture. Okay. Now Krishna takes this further, and he says, "Look at me. 
If you're still in doubt about whether you should act or not, whether you should be engaged with the world or not, look at me. 20 seconds. Name Pathas Tikatavyam Name Pathas Tikatavyam Trishu Loke Shukinchana Trishu Loke Shukinchana Nana Vaptam Avaptavyam Nana Vaptam Avaptavyam Varta Eva Chakarmani Varta Eva Chakarmani So if you still, Arjuna, if you still have a doubt whether I should be engaged with the world or not, look at me. I have no duty in this world. Uh, in three worlds, in all the worlds, I have no duty. Because I have nothing to gain. Whatever There is nothing that I have not got and there is nothing for me further to gain. And therefore, there is nothing that, that I have to do. And yet, I am continuously in action. I'm continuously, I, I work continuously. So you can take Krishna as a Jivan Mukta, as an enlightened person, or as an avatar. In either case, the idea is that generally we act because we want something. So I want money or pleasure or um, fame or achievement, and I work towards that. As one should. And if I have achieved, if such a state comes where I have achieved all of that, suppose I don't want any of these, I want enlightenment. I want to be like Buddha or Vivekananda or something. But I have to work towards that also. There are things to be done. You have to meditate and repeat a mantra and uh, um, do good deeds to people and attend endless Vedanta classes. Lots of things to be done. So I work towards that too. But suppose you have at attained that too. Suppose you are an enlightened being. Now what do you have to work towards? You have Krishna says there is nothing for me to work towards. And yet I am in action. Why he will tell later. But I am in action all the time. I, I, do, not, I do not abandon action. So look at me and if you think you are enlightened. Well still take a look at me. I am enlightened. You can, at least you consider me to be enlightened. Or an avatar which is higher. And here I am engaged in action. So this is the argument that Krishna is putting forward to uh, Arjuna. Let me mention here. Does an enlightened person, before enlightenment, or let me go even further back, in the world do we need to act? You say everybody will say yes. You'll be in trouble if you don't act. You'll be homeless very soon and then um, you'll be out of medical insurance. You will be out of this and that. And, and your own body and mind will, will um, you know, you'll become sick or ill if you don't take care of yourself. And so many things ha will happen if you don't work, if you're not engaged in action. At the personal level, at the family level, at your professional level. Holy Mother used to say in a very simple way to the ladies around her, would say, my dear, work is Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth. She would say in Bengali, Kaj Lokhi. But what does, in which sense does she mean it? She says, both the body and mind will be well if you are engaged in work. So, and she set an example. She worked harder than, I mean, the people around her were a hard-working lot, but she worked harder than anybody else. From early before sunrise till late in the night, she was engaged. Meditation, worship, cooking, cleaning, counseling, taking care of people. So many things. And the number of people she took care of. From monks, to the ladies of the house, to the children, uh, the cows in the cow shed, down to the parrot in the cage. There was a par parrot too. <laughs> when it would, it, it would call out Gangaram, I think. And she would <laughs> cry out from the kitchen, uh, Yes, my child, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> so she took care of everybody not as a favor she says it's a very good practice it's a very good thing to do people ask how do you get peace of mind each yoga has a different answer karma yoga says you get peace of mind if you are more concerned with the 
with helping others than with your own trouble. Very simple, direct solution. In earlier days, I've seen in families in India, one of the persons who would be most hard at work would be the grandmother, often maybe a widow, uh, but she's busy. She's not keeping the best of health herself. But there are um, children and grandchildren and affairs of the house to be looked after and so many things. She doesn't have a moment to spare to look after herself. And she keeps well. <laughs> An example. Where if you are taking care of others, even for monks, one very senior monk in our, we have a hospital where, uh, one of the first hospitals started by our order in Banaras in Kashi. So the monks, they actually, along with the nurses and the doctors, they actually work there in the, in the hospital wards and take care of the patients. One of the older monks who was working there uh, in the 1930s, 40s maybe, he is talking to a group of younger monks. Uh, he is saying that, um, what is all this you complain about? that you have bad thoughts and impure thoughts and uh, you feel unhappy, you have to struggle with your mind, your mind uh, you know, is not under control. Monastic problems. What is all this that I hear? When I became a monk 50 years ago in that hospital, the first thing I found that people are suffering and there, is, there isn't, we are chronically understaffed. So from early in the morning, I would rush to the hospital. I know this person needs a medicine. That person needs these fruits cut and uh, given to that person. This person needs the bed, plant, bed pan to be cleaned. And I am there. And often I would, he, he said, we would miss our lunch. The lunch would be in the ashram. So you have to come from the hospital to the ashram. We would miss lunch or we would realize late that it's already lunch time. And in the monasteries, there are a little rootless. There's a bell. <laughs> and God help you. Even God can't help you. If you're, if you're more than 30 seconds late. <laughs> uh, so, and these, uh, uh, he said we would go back to the monastery to find everybody gone and a plate of cold food left out there. Or sometimes we miss that too. And then we rushed back. Missing that most important thing in uh, you know, the Indian, nowadays you know, the, the great Indian siesta. Not so, people are very busy in India, but in monasteries we preserve the ancient tradition. <laughs> Somebody said, Belurmat, our main monastery. Yeah, they said, what a wonderful place. When everybody's up and working, these monks are sleeping. <laughs> Every, that's a peak working hour, two o'clock, two three o'clock in the afternoon, gates shut. And <laughs> all the <laughs> swamis are interested. But in the, the defense of the swamis, they get up at 3.30 in the morning. So they need it. So it's, but it's an old tradition. In India, everybody used to do that until recently. Now it's very corporatized. Everybody's working all the time. Um, and we would miss that. The afternoon siesta, go back to the hospital and work and work till we would come back. We would miss the evening meditation. And we would come back late in the night where if there was any food, we would have that and go to bed we would repeat the mantra a few times. The moment our heads touch the pillow, go to sleep. You're so exhausted. And 50 years have passed. Just passed like that. We never felt that you have to struggle with uh, you know, impure thoughts or anger or lust and mind is not under control. There's no time for that. <laughs> of course, all credit to him because he had the mentality to stick it through for and that's a machine which purifies you. This is called chitta shuddhi, purification of the mind. So work is, is absolutely very good when you're climbing your way up to enlightenment. In the world, yes, and on your way to enlightenment, work is absolutely necessary. But the question is, after enlightenment, Krishna is talking about somebody, suppose Arjuna says, I know, I'm enlightened. Then, do I still do I do, do need to do work for people? Um, here, there are three alternatives. Swami Gambhirānandaji, who was the 11th president of the order, he wrote a very nice essay about this. Enlightened person and work. 
three possibilities for the Jivan Mukta. Jivan Mukta is enlightened while living, still in this body. The ideal of the Bhagavad Gita. You realize your identity as the absolute. You know who you are, what you are. And you continue to exist in this body as long as the body lives. He says there are actually three possibilities. One is the enlightened person has no engagement with the world. Fully enlightened. Has no engagement with the world. Has nothing to do with with the world or at least more or less nothing to do with the world and there are examples see that's why this is a question if everybody you consider to be enlightened was up and doing running a hospital or a school okay there's no question about it they, they, they do it so we i have to look which which is the closest hospital i can <laughs> go and work in or or a uh, school or something but that's not true there were so many enlightened people and there are till now who have absolutely nothing to do with society there it's possible so he says the first category is an enlightened being who is absolutely absorbed in the transcendent aspect of Brahman. I am Brahman. The world is an appearance. I have nothing to do with it. Including one's own body and mind. Um, absolutely. For an enlightened person, even th is one's own body and mind is part of the world. It is not Brahman. It's an, like a snake in a rope. Do I need to get up and drive the snake away? No. It's a mistake. It's not there. Somebody, another example is the blue color in the sky. How do you remove the blue color in the sky? Do you scrub? <laughs> no. Gaudapad in the Mandukya Karika says, if the samsara was there, we could have removed it. It's not there. So the enlightened person, there are examples. Ramana Maharshi, great example. He lived uh, on a mountain. Yes, so many people went there and they got uh, benefit from it. But... He was not engaged in um, social action. Don't mistake me. He did a lot of work. Um, Swami Damodarananda, who was a great Swami of our order, who passed away a few years ago. He was nearly 96. One of the most wonderful Swamis. I still have wonderful memories of him. As a young man, young boy actually, he, w he ran away from home and went to uh, meet Ramana Maharshi. And he went to Ramana Maharshi. He wrote about it later in an article in the Mountain Path. Uh, he went to Ramana Maharshi and he stayed in that place, in the Arunachala, in the, in the cave with Ramana Maharshi for a few days. And he writes about how they were sitting and dressing vegetables together. Ramana Maharshi himself. He would take part in all the activities of the ashram. He would insist in doing all the work which everybody else was doing. And... Uh, and then he asked, what do you want in life? What do you want to do? And fin Ramana Maharshi told him, go to the Ramakrishna order and become a monk. <laughs> and he obeyed. And so he went. And, and then he was there for so many years. I saw him in his old age. I attended some of his classes. Totally irrelevant fact, but interesting fact. Even at the age of 95, he had perfect teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and... His dental records are a case study in a, um, in a medical college in Australia. <laughs> yes, that, you, that it is possible. <laughs> anyway, that's nothing to do with here or there, with to do with <laughs> enlightenment. <laughs> so he's, he said that he saw Ramana Maharshi working, uh, actually doing work. So, but that's there, but not, not on the scale of schools and colleges and hospitals, and uh, none of that. No social action. Even more, Totapuri, a wandering monk, knower of Brahman, enlightened. Pro probably the only interaction he had with society was the occasional student he taught. And the students were of a little high caliber, like Ramakrishna. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and that's not an isolated example. There have been such people. Is it all right? It's perfectly all right. Sri Ramakrishna himself tells the story about the three friends who are walking along and they see a high wall and they're curious about what's on the other side of the wall and with great difficulty one of them climbs up and sees something on the other side and shouts, oh, how wonderful, and dances on top of the parapet and jumps on the other side. And the other two are befuddled. What happened? What did he see? The second person climbs over and starts jumping and shouting, oh, how wonderful, and jumps over without telling anything to this. The third person climbs up there and he sees a wonderful festival going on on the other side, um, uh, like a festival of joy and wonderful things are happening. And he wants to join his friends there and, and uh, have fun there. But then he realizes, 
who will go back to the village and tell the poor suffering people there that such a sun- wonderful thing is there? So he turns around. He doesn't go over the uh, ledge. He c- comes back to. So those are the people who come back and tell us. They come back and tell us. And thank God. <laughs> so that's the first category who do not get involved. Uh, so this, uh, the first two who jumped over the ledge, they belong to the first category. Some teach a few people. Some may not even teach. Some may remain completely unknown to society. Sri Ramakrishna says they're enlightened people who, whom you would take for madmen. Crazy. There's a second category, Swami Gambiranji says, of an enlightened being, Jivan Mukta, who regards this world, not as non-existence, as a wonderful play of Maya and delights in the play of Maya. Still not much practical good to you, but sees the world as, as a, like a magic show. There's a description of a yogi who came to Dakshineshwar when Sri Ramakrishna was there, and he would meditate all day in his room. Only once in a day he would come out of the room and look at, at the Ganga, the river Ganga, and the temple, and the towering, maybe the clouds in the sky, and, and shout, wow, wow, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, how wo- wonderful all this is. And then go back to his room and go back into meditation. That's the second category. Who look upon, the first category looks upon the world as an appearance, not, uh, no attention there. They're absorbed in Brahman or in God. Second category looks upon the world as a magic show, as something wonderful. They are sometimes, these people are the crazy people of God. They, l- they behave like lunatics sometimes. The third category, Swami Gambhirananda says, is those who see this same, they are also fully enlightened. They see all of this and their hearts, are o- their hearts overflow with compassion for the rest of us. And they turn uh, their back on um, you know, that complete transcendence and they come back to us and they teach and they help us. These are the great teachers of religion from the centuries, from, from millennia. And to them we owe this royal road to uh, enlightenment whether it's the Buddhas or the Ramakrishnas or Vivekananda, Christ, and so on. We have different classifications. We, we say someone is an incarnation, someone is a prophet, someone is an en- a Jivan Mukta. That's all later systematization. But definitely these are people who have shown us the path to enlightenment, the great spiritual masters of humanity. So these are the three options. Why I said this, Sri Krishna prefers the... Sri Krishna prefers the third one, correct. The third option, if you ask Sri Krishna, what should one do? What should an enlightened person do? He says it's better to be like the third one. Mm -hmm. We are reading the Sermon on the Mount. This is a part I did not read. The Bible, Jesus Christ says to his his apostles that you will be like a city on, on, on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. So he also wants his disciples who have got that knowledge, then share it. Uh, let it shine forth in the world. There are many people who are hungry for this. So they, they will. Buddha, when Mara, which is uh, the Buddhist equivalent of Maya, tempted him to stop him from getting enlightenment, did not work. Scared him, tried to scare him, did not work. Finally, the Buddha got enlightenment. One last try, Mara, appeared before the Buddha and said, uh, Well, you have done it. You have seen through the veils of illusion. You have seen the truth. But you know something? Nobody will ever understand what what you have seen. There's no use trying to tell these people. And the Buddha, thank God, he said, some perchance may understand. And so he walked to Sarnath to give his first sermon there. And then 2,500 years ago, the whole history of Buddhism starts from there. So Sri Krishna clearly says he prefers this third kind who is engaged for the welfare of the world. One more. Yadi hyam na kvateyam Yadi hyam na vateyam Jatu karmanya tandrita Jatu karmanya tandrita Mama vatmanu vatante Mama Vatman Uvatante Manusha Partha Sarvasha Manusha Partha Sarvasha 
if I did not do so, that means if I did not engage myself in action, atandrita, tirelessly, tirelessly, then humanity would follow in my footsteps. They, they would do, if I did not perform action, they would also stop performing action. Mama vatmanu vattante. The path that I take, humanity too would follow it. What's wrong with that? You are an enlightened person. Even Shankaracharya says, tata jakka dosha. So what's wrong with that? Shankaracharya comments here. What is the harm if people follow you? You are Krishna. You are an enlightened person. You are an avatar. People should follow you. Suppose you do not act and people do follow you. What will happen? 24. Utside yur ime loka. Utside yur ime loka. Nakur yam karma chedaham. Nakur yam karma chedaham. Sankarasya chakartasyam. Sankarasya chakartasyam. Upa hanyami maf praja. Upa hanyami maf praja. If I do not work, if I do not engage myself in action, the worlds would perish. I, may, I will cause confusion and will ruin these living beings. The worlds would perish means, the Shankaracharya comments, the stability of the world, of civilization. You will upset the, the stability of civilization. People will um, start following me and may withdraw from action. If I withdraw from action, and then, then uh, what would uh, society and civilization come to uh, if people did not fulfill their duties and obligations and their role in society and all sort of withdrew from action to sit in a cave? Not possible for the majority of humanity. Once the Holy Mother, Masharada, she was telling one of the younger monks, Vivekananda, she said, um, Naren, Rakhal, Tarok, Vivekananda, Brahmananda, Shivananda. She said, my child, they are of such stature, they could live their lives meditating under a tree. It is for you that they spend their lives blood building these monasteries and all. For the generations who would come later on. So that's the standard. They don't need these monasteries. They don't need any of this. They are the ones who can actually withdraw from action without any harm to their own spiritual life. But no, they did it for future generations of spiritual seekers and as an example to the world. Uh, they spent till the last moment. Vivekananda worked till the last moment. of, And all of them, they worked till the last moment of their lives. If I do not engage myself in action, Shankarasya Chakattasyam, I will be the cause of confusion. So people will be confused about their duties and obligations. If Krishna didn't do it, then why should I do it? Why should I earn money, support a family, do my job and look after society, uphold morality and ethics, provide leadership, um, fight against injustice? Why? The Lord himself who came as an avatar didn't do it, so I won't do it either. No. Upahanyam imah praja. I would be the cause of destruction of 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 praja means all beings in this in this world and people. Remember what he's referring to here is the doctrine of the avatara. The avatara comes to help us. And so he's saying what a travesty that would be, what a paradox that would be, tragic paradox that would be. I am supposed to help and raise civilization. And if I, I would be the cause of the destruction of civilization if I did that, if I if I did not engage in action. Suppose Arjuna thinks, yes, but if I get engaged in action, won't I become worldly again, get trapped in the world? We think sometimes like that. Because we make a clear division between the sacred and the secular. Here is my spiritual life and here is my worldly life. Sri Krishna wants us to erase that difference. What does he want us to do? He, want us, he wants us to spiritualize the whole of our life. Even the, m the mundane actions. Remember, wherever we are, 
whatever we are doing, the truth is we are actually centered in God all the time. In the worst of times also, I will say shocking things, but it's not shocking from the Advaitic perspective. In the time of depression, in the time of sin also, in the time of the worst of circumstances in our life, when we think we are far away from spirituality and religion, we are perfectly centered in God. It makes perfect sense from Advaita philosophy, from, from the uh, Advaita metaphysics. Only we don't know it. Only we don't know it. We are not aware of it. Psychologically, we are not centered in God. Psychologically, we are scattered in the world. That's why this problem happens. All we need to do is just take cognizance of a fact. Our relationship is not with the world. That which changes continuously and that which does not change, the two cannot have a relationship. If at all this idea is true, that the Atman, the self, is an unchanging reality, it is an obvious fact that the world is changing. Everything is changing in the world. Body is changing. Our own minds are changing continuously. Then I, the unchanging Atman, have no relationship with the world, with the body, with even the mind. No relationship at all. I am always centered in the divine self. Another thing. That which changes continuously is an appearance. That which is real does not change. Only problem is the real does not appear before us. That's why we think it's not there. The real, the Atman, pure being is always there. As a great philosopher, Bradley, uh, he was, I'm saying great philosopher because I've read a little bit about him. Nobody reads him nowadays. <laughs> he was an idealistic philosopher in the, uh, in at, at Cambridge or Oxford in the early part of the 20th century. He was an elder contemporary of Bertrand Russell. He wrote this book called Appearance and Reality. So at the very beginning he says, what appears is not real and the real never appears. It's a play on the two meanings of the English word appearance. Appearance means what you see here, that it has appeared to you. The second meaning of appearance is in the sense of de deceptive. So that person appears to be trustworthy. What am I saying? Not trustworthy. <laughs> so appearance is deceptive. So appearance is has two meanings. Has two meanings. One is what is what you are experiencing. That appears the world appears to us. Second meaning is deceptive. It appearance means appears as something as it is really not. So the reality never appears. What appears is not real. When I, we had this old book, Appearance and Reality, in our library. And uh, I was a novice at that time. Uh, this was um, 20 years ago. Um, so I was going through that book and I found it so Vedantic. But I thought it's difficult. So I thought, who will teach it to me? We had a professor, a retired professor, come in to teach us Western philosophy. A very nice, old, ma uh, very interesting old man. Uh, Nirod Bharan Chakravarti, he's passed on since. He was a disciple of Swami Abhedananda. So you have a connection to Swami Abhedananda here. Um, so I asked him, that, sir, would you consider tutoring me in this book, Appearance and Reality? And he was so delighted. This old professor, he looked, he, had, he was short with big eyes. He said, oh, Maharaj, th that's what they call him. Maharaj, we want to study this. Nobody wants to read it anymore. <laughs> Nobody wants to read these books anymore. Of course, if you want to read it, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. So he would give up his afternoon siesta. <laughs> Very big sacrifice. He would come to teach us, and we would give him a room to take rest before the class. So that rest time, he gave it up to teach me. And uh, we went through about half the book, Appearance and Reality. There are two parts of the book. First part is Appearance. Second part is reality. We never got to reality. <laughs> but <laughs> the appearance part I read. And I'll share something interesting. A uh, couple of months ago, I was at, at Harvard in the philosophy class there. Um, in the class, suddenly the professor asked, and all these guys are very smart people. They are all, uh, all doing graduate work. So the professor asked, by the way, has anyone here read Bradley? And I was the only one who raised my <laughs> <laughs> And he was so delighted. He said, look, <laughs> you've read it. 
and uh, we had little back and forth and he said i recommend it strongly to all of you you should if you're going to understand buddhism you should read bradley yeah so appearance in reality what appears is not real what uh, what is real never appears what appears to us world and people and duties and action is an appearance it's not real and what is real the self the pure consciousness pure being which we are it never appears as an object to you uh, that's always there so we are always choicelessly centered in divinity we are always there being centered in divinity deal with this appearance dealing with this appearance is what is called work what's your problem no harm will come to you so that's what krishna is telling how should you work he says as people in the world work with great attachment and desire and tension and anxiety do you do the same activities you may work in you may take care of a family do your job in a com- in the community in the corporation in your co- in your company um, and do all that work but in an enlightened fashion as an enlightened being how like this uh, as i'm always centered in divinity he says did we read this 25 24 we have read so 25 is coming next he will tell how should i work then suppose i have to work and you are an enlightened person how do you work then or you are a spiritual seeker on the path of enlightenment you are afraid to get entangled in the world again then how should you work 25 sakta karmanya vidvanso sakta karmanya vidvanso yatha kurubanti bharata yatha kurubanti bharata kuryad vidvans tatha sakta kuryad vidvans tatha sakta chikir shuloka sangraham chikir shuloka sangraham just as ordinary people in the world work with so much attachment sakta become so attached i will do this and get this and therefore they work do you also do the work which work oh i am an enlightened being i will only teach vedanta but nothing else that's the only work for me no whatever is in front of you whatever is in front of you do that if teaching vedanta is in front of you do that but if if holding a job and taking care of a family or uh, running an organization is in front of you teaching in class is in front of you do that which place is apart from god so d- do that but kuriyad vidwans tatha sakta you do that without attachment without attachment being centered in the divinity do that without attachment they do it with attachment they want something out of it but then why should i do it what's the purpose chikir shu loka sangraham desiring the welfare of all beings all beings loka sangraham means welfare of all beings let all be happy let all be without disease let all overcome uh, obstructions in their lives and the old sanskrit prayers are vedic prayers are there all not just me and mine then that samsara it becomes samsara again be a well-wisher to everybody in the world including people you might think oh they are enemies or they don't like me including them too they are no different from anybody else and they are all nothing other than god god in all of those forms so you, do, you seek to do welfare to why should i do welfare to god god doesn't need welfare all right you worship god in those forms that's your worship worship does not only mean flowers and incense and mantras it can also mean go go to class and teach kids it can mean medicines and nursing given to a patient literally the divinity is in front of you all our lives our only tragedy is not the so called tragedies which we are uh, which we keep on complaining about sri ramakrishna says who weeps for god people weep buckets of tears for the children and for money he has found out the two main things which cause tears children and money <laughs> <laughs> who weeps for god so you work desiring their welfare or you can work work as worship of the lord in all of these forms then one more verse i 
think Madhusudan Saraswati says this. Wait a minute. I have realized the world is an appearance, that the divinity alone is real, existence, consciousness, bliss. I am the witness consciousness. And realizing this, one gets enlightened and free from all sufferings. So if I really want to help people, I will liberate them from their sufferings. So my work should basically be give endless Vedanta classes. Right? Why, why should I do anything else? Why should I do anything else? Tell them, hey, don't run after uh, money or uh, sense pleasures or the, the fleeting vanities of this world. The beginning of, of um, imitation of Christ. Vanities of va vanity of vanities, all is vanity, except uh, to love the Lord, to worship the Lord. So that was the core idea of every religion. So why should I not do that? Why should I, what's the ne need for uh, schools and colleges and homeless shelters and uh, uh, social activism? Why should I need all that? Why do I need to do all that? He says here, 26th verse, very important. Na buddhi vedam janayed, na buddhi vedam janayed, agyanam karma sanginam, agyanam karma sanginam, Joshayet sarva karmani, Joshayet sarva karmani, Vidwan yukta samacharan, Vidwan yukta samacharan. Yukta, being centered in your divine self. Na buddhi vedam janayet. Do not confuse people. Do not throw them into confusion. Whom? Karma sanginam. Those who are worldly and they are, they are headlong pursuing worldly success and fame and pleasure. And anyway, they haven't asked you. <laughs> so don't confuse them. What is confusion? Madhusudan Saraswati says, confusion is, you know all this you are pursuing? It will not give you any pleasure. It will not give you any satisfaction. It is all maya. Rather, you are existence, consciousness, bliss. That which you are looking for is within yourself. Realize that and be happy. Stop doing these things. Now what will happen is they will not be able to reach enlightenment. They will not be able to progress spiritually. And what they wanted to do in life, that also, because if you are truly, if you have some depth in spiritual life, when you speak, because these words are true, it echoes in people's minds. And what it does first is it harms them. It, it um, weakens their, uh, um, you know, their one-pointed focus on the world. Somewhere inside it, um, it throws them into confusion. They will still go to the world, but with weakened resolve, they will try to be spiritual with, with, with no results at all, and it will be a mess. Rather, what did Swami Vivekananda said? If you are able to help, then take everybody wherever they are and give them an upward lift. Yes. You want money? Wealth? Yes. You know your spirituality. What do you say from a spiritual perspective? All very good, but do it ethically. Uh, whatever you can get through your own hard work within the limits of morality and ethics, that's good. And once you get it, try to see how you can help others. Don't you see? You, you will get much more happiness that way. Now that's you have not stopped that person from trying to become a millionaire or make a killing on the stock exchange. Go ahead. But now you try to guide him towards philanthropy and um, selflessness uh, and expansion of the self. If you had said, stop, no good there. Come to the ashram, to the mountains. I'll find a cave for you. Sit there and meditate and realize that you are Brahman. Won't work. Even the greatest of things, monasteries, that were beautiful, I'll end with that. I've told this earlier. Um, one of Swami Vivekananda's disciples asked him, um, can you tell me about Maya? Swami Vivekananda was very pleased with him and said, ask me for a boon. And he said, explain Maya to me. Swami Vivekananda said, ask something else. <laughs> then the disciple persisted. It's in the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. He persisted. And he said, if with a guru like you, I don't get an answer to this question, I'll never get an answer to this question. Then Vivekananda started speaking. 
and he talked at length for some time and the disciple just records how he sat in stunned silence and he says literally the room around me began to whirl and disappear into a light where Vivekananda also disappeared, my body had also disappeared but only the voice went on, Vivekananda's voice. And at one point I shouted out, but Swami, all your work, even the Ramakrishna mission, these monasteries you're building, all of this is also Maya. This is also illusion. This is also Maya. This is not real either. And Vivekananda said, oh, at that point he said a thought, a, another thought came to me. The Bengali, he had used the Bengali diminutive. In Indian languages, there are different ways you address people. You know, like you and thou. And so in Bengali, he should have said apni to Vivekananda because Vivekananda was his guru. That's how you address a revered person, a senior. Um, maybe somebody older than you in age or seniority or in some way. Equals you say to me. And of course, yeah, there, there's another one, tui, which is to maybe children or somebody who's very dear to you. So he had said to me, the one which you use for equals to Vivekananda. And he, just the moment the thought came to him, the whole thing vanished and we found Vivekananda sitting there and, and looking down at him and smiling and saying, he had said, all this is illusion, it's all Maya, what, even what you are doing, all this Belur Mat and everything you're building. Vivekananda said, yes. And if you can realize this and meditate and be absorbed in Brahman, go ahead and do it. Or if you cannot, then come and help in this work. Yeah. Hinduism, Vedanta, is a very graded path. It's a very graded path. You can start with moral life, with a little bit of religion and uh, observances and ethics and temples, all the way up, the same path, takes you all the way up to, who am I? Ramana Maharshi is sitting in the cave and telling, find out who you are and that solves every problem. In between is meditation, is devotion, um, yoga, tantra, so many things are there. The entire spectrum is there. And it's all good and useful. But for whom and where? And so the enlightened person may not need that work. But still it's good for the others. And how do you do that work? Do that work just like everybody else does it. Don't be strange. Don't be like, I've come to the office, but don't think I'm like you. <laughs> I'm actually, though you don't see it, I'm pure consciousness. <laughs> only acting in this, through this body and mind for your welfare. <laughs> You're going to get called to human resources very fast, <laughs> very soon. <laughs> Sri Krishna says, as they do it, as you've been doing it, keep on doing that. The wisest and most enlightened people, Gaurapada says, Mandukya Karika. After enlightened, behave like a fool, he says. <laughs> Just be like everybody else. Don't. Everybody is Brahman, which you are. So why do you have to glorify this one particular body and mind and say, here is this enlightened person? No. Just as they are, but internally you are completely different. You are centered in your divine self. You know Aham Brahmasmi, you know that. And you act in the world. Joshayet Sarva Karmani. Encourage them in every action. Moral action, ethical action. That is what Vivekananda said. Give them an upward lift. Give them an upward lift. If you can, wherever you are. Believe in the potential, the spiritual potential of all beings. That everybody can be better physically, morally, mentally. This entire wellness movement across the western world and now spreading across the world. Very good. If you look at the Vedantic perspective, uh, it's for, for the good of many. You might say that's not particularly spiritually high. It's just a you know, fit body and good. Wherever they are, from that a little higher and inject a little few, few higher ideas that there's something beyond this also. Something higher than this. I have seen, I, I was at a yoga ashram um, until yesterday in the Bahamas and um, hundreds of young people from all over the world. Their main attraction is not a Vedanta talk. I was giving Vedanta talks. And they have not come there for Brahman or Atman. Or they have come, th come there for the, um, the downward dog and the, this is <laughs> the asanas <laughs> and the pranayamas. But good. I, I like the way it has the whole thing has been arranged. 
that yes, you come for the yoga course, do the yoga course, but sit for the evening arati, uh, uh, sing in the bhajans, sit for the morning and evening meditation, and listen to the uh, Vedanta talks. Uh, we used to say when we became monks earlier, uh, well when uh, early when we were monks, when we just started in this life, Vedanta classes were difficult for us. And all the swamis would sit around, but they would insist that the newcomers would just sit, look at the text, read the text, sit and listen. They would call it uh, purification of the years. <laughs> In Bengali, karno shuddhi. <laughs> all right. So this actually completes a topic. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namaste